Now I would like to introduce our guest speaker today. June Klein-Bacon joined BIA Iowa in October of 2013 with 15 years of experience in disability and aging services. June joined BIA Iowa as a neural resource facilitator in our Waterloo office and provides neural resource facilitation to Northeast, North Central, and Northwest Iowa to a 31 county region and also serves as project manager, coordinating BIA Iowa's Administration for Community Living contract across the state of Iowa. This includes projects for concussion management protocols, case consultation, and technical assistance for programs serving individuals with multi-occurring conditions, including brain injury, mental health conditions, substance abuse disorders, and high-risk populations involved with the criminal justice system. June is also involved at multiple tables for systems and public policy advocacy. Thank you all for participating today, and I will go ahead and unmute June and let her get started. Uh, good morning, everybody. I uh, just want to first say thank you for joining us today, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, to share with you. Uh, so today we're going to talk a little bit about brain injury um, screening and uh, focus a bit on brain injury assessment. So I just want to say thank you again uh, to Annie for that uh, introduction. It's always interesting uh, to hear a bit about yourself. So, um, so we'll go get right into it. Um, just have a couple of disclosures that I do want to make sure uh, that we cover uh, here at the beginning. Um, we have two disclosures. First is the projects discussed in this presentation uh, are a result of a contract that we do have with the Department of Public Health, um, the Iowa Department of Public Health, administering a TBI state demonstration grant with the Administration for Community Living. Um, and then secondly, the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa does hold two contracts um, with mental health disability service regions uh, to complete functional assessments with their clients receiving funding for services in the community. So just wanna make sure that those disclosures are there. Uh, a few uh, to cover objectives. Um, in reviewing the number of folks that registered for this webinar, um, we did notice, uh, take note of some of the backgrounds and wanted just to take a moment to be sure that you know that we will not be covering uh, information today regarding the new um, and the adjustments made to the youth sports and concussion law uh, on today's webinar. Uh, we're certainly, um, we certainly understand the significant interest uh, in this topic, uh, as we certainly have that interest as well. We will be hosting an alternative webinar later this month on the 29th um, to discuss some of the landscape changes that we're seeing on that front. Um, today, however, we're going to be discussing a very brief review of changes and challenges that occur with brain injury, um, which likely will be a, an overview for most of you. So again, that will be a, a pretty quick review. Um, advisement for screening consideration for brain injury in your respective field and practice. And then our last focus will be to discuss assessments of brain injury. Okay, so when we, when we talk about um, brain injury and what is brain injury, we know that the brain is made up of communicating cells that make up uh, functional networks. Many of us have seen brain behavior relationship di diagrams that describe which lobes manage various functions um, as a rudimentary layout of our brain, which controls various cognitive, physical, and emotional functions. Um, this controls things like our fears, our memories, and information processing also happens all within our brain. Um, so just for purposes of brief definition, uh, just to be sure that we have that on the table, um, when I reference brain injury, I'm, I'm kind of shortening acquired brain injury. Acquired brain injury is something that occurs after birth. Um, it does not include neurodegenerative disorders, um, something that we commonly think about in terms of like maybe Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease, um, those kinds of things. It does not include those. Um, traumatic brain injury falls underneath the umbrella of acquired brain injury. Um, TBI, traumatic brain injury, is really all about physics. It's caused by an energy tra transfer, um, can be caused by a blast shock wave, a blow, 
a jolt, a fall, or a motor vehicle crash. Um, this is an acute event when an external force injures the brain. Um, then when we talk about concussion, uh, concussion is certainly something we're hearing more and more about. Um, we, we do want to make note that concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. And many of us um, haven't always considered that when we talk about brain injury. A concussion creates an energy crisis in our brains, resulting in a loss of function for a period of time. Um, so that, that's something also to be, be aware of as, as we go through this discussion um, and as you think about clients that you may be serving. Um, and just in, in thinking about brain injury, the, the, and thinking particularly about traumatic brain injury, the structure of our head or our skull, uh, while generally protects our brain, um, does not necessarily protect our brain in high velocity situations. Um, you can see in the graphic that was playing, um, and I can and I can uh, play that again. Um, our our brain slit, sits in fluid, um, cerebral fluid, inside our skull, and in a higher velocity hit, our brain can be damaged by colliding with the inside of our bony the bony structure inside of the skull, um, and this can occur occur again during a motor vehicle crash, a collision during a sporting event, a fall. Um, which consequently, by the way, falls are the number one cause of traumatic brain injury. Um, so just to kind of be aware of that. So we are hearing more about brain injury, uh, certainly from the sports arena. It's filtering into the development of public policy around mild brain injury, um, better known as concussion. Our military, where we've heard about brain injury being caused over the last decade or more um, with such a significant rate, um, is being considered the signature injury of our recent conflicts. Um, and from advocacy groups like ours and, and possibly yours, we're hearing just more about brain injury in, in our communities. Um, so what does this really mean? Um, technology to save people has not necessarily kept up to manage the issues that individuals experience as a result of brain injury. So what are those results? Um, we hear about um, high profile athletes sharing their, those stories. Uh, we've seen lawsuits. Um, some of you may know about um, the NFL settlement or there has been a lawsuit right here in Iowa, in Bedford, Iowa at the high school level um, due to brain injury. Um, and we know that there's been uh, an increase of uh, discussion and change in concussion laws, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, we just saw those change. We've had a concussion, uh, youth sports concussion law in Iowa since 2011, and, and now it's been updated now here in 2018. Um, data is certainly showing us that more people are surviving a variety of accidents, crashes, and other events. Um, and what that means is that more people are living with brain injury as a result. So our brain is very interconnected. Um, and while a simplified description um, and location of injury can tell us a great deal about someone's uh, deficits and challenges they may experience, it is imperative uh, for us to recognize that brain injury may disrupt a variety of functions that can include cognitive, emotional, behavioral, and physical uh, changes that can be quite complex. And premature efforts um, to return to what we often refer to as the old normal can result in secondary conditions um, in, in addition to not being connected to information, services, and supports. Um, this may lead to scenarios in which uh, folks find themselves accessing inappropriate or incomplete treatment options to address their needs, um, or none at all, landing them sometimes in um, what we may see as a marginalized area of our society. Um, we're seeing statistics come out from the mental health community, criminal justice, and our TBI model systems um, across the nation that show us a high prevalence rate of folks um, that experience brain injury and psychiatric conditions. Um, we see that um, brain injury survivors continue to abuse alcohol and other drugs at a high rate. 
um, high rates, uh, 60 plus percent um, of those incarcerated um, having experienced a traumatic brain injury prior to incarceration. There's also a study uh, in some emerging science um, and, and research coming out of a TBI model system showing that 72 percent of individuals that experience a, a severe mental illness and a substance abuse diagnosis have had at least one traumatic brain injury in their history. Um, so we're, we're just seeing some um, need for cross-training and, and uh, cross, across disciplines uh, because we're, we are aware that brain injury screening is not systematic across disciplines. And as, an identified, as identified by a wide range of statistics, uh, we recognize that rarely does an individual enter a system of care with a single condition or concern. Um, and that's why we find it important that we're collaborating with those of you that are on, on our webinar today um, and across systems to encourage brain injury screening um, taking place at, during intake, um, to, to lean and, and to then lean into colleagues in their fields of expertise for case consultation and building quality treatment plans um, and service plans for those folks. The brain injuries are often referred to as a silent epidemic. Um, we, we hear that often in our community uh, because some of the symptoms are not always immediately evident and the general public has limited knowledge about the diagnosis. Brain injury can cause increased susceptibility again to those multi-occurring conditions, including mental health and substance use disorders. Um, to, to note some of the research that's coming that, we, that we've been able to, to see 34 to 49 percent um, prevalence rate of mental health conditions in individuals with brain injury uh, with the highest rates um, with individuals experiencing depression and anxiety. Um, there's again the study out of Ohio Valley um, model system, TBI model systems giving us the information um, about about those numbers with um, high rates of folks experiencing brain injury, mental health and substance use disorders. Um, we also see um, out of that system uh, showing us that approximately 20% of individuals begin using substances after their initial brain injury. Um, so we see that as an as a, um, area of need to uh, cross train and, and collaborate with folks uh, experts in, the, in, that, in that area. Um, we have seen in Iowa, we ha we've had opportunities to do some screening um, and noticed um, some gaps in brain injury identification. Um, these, a couple of these um, examples back in 2005, the Department of Public Health supported a screening project at a community mental health center uh, where 57% 50 per of the folks they screened um, came back positive for possible brain injury. And then in 2014, uh, we were able to participate with, uh, again, under that contract with the Department of Public Health on a screening project with some, some women that um, experienced incarceration. And they, we saw a 67% um, positive screening rate with that group. So we, we certainly recognize um, that not everyone who experiences a brain injury has long-term impairments. Screenings are there for us to address. If there was an incident, the level of severity, symptoms that a person may be experiencing, uh, and service providers have to decide when to incorporate, when it makes sense to screen within their processes and procedures, and if screenings would make, would make sense at intake or another another uh, point of contact within their, within their procedures and provision of services um, that would be most beneficial and be effective um, and efficient in terms of resource, resource use. Um, a screening tool is certainly not intended for diagnostic purposes. The information can provide the individual as well as te the team information for next steps identify if an assessment is needed for diagnosis or treatment, uh, treatment planning, if that would be necessary. 
And once a person has identified they have a positive screen for brain injury or report to you that they, that they have history of brain injury, um, then it's important to be communicating about what that means. Um, not necessarily that a screening is a clinical diagnosis, but that you can provide the team with an opportunity to evaluate, you know, if a clinical diagnosis is necessary uh, to access appropriate medical support. Um, in addition, that information may be valuable in terms of building a service plan that's unique to the concerns that they might have, um, allowing opportunity for referrals for additional assessments to happen. Those kinds of things can happen if you're aware of brain injury with the clients that you're serving. So let's talk a little bit about assessments. Um, there are three different levels of assessments just to identify, um, and they have different purposes. When accessing assessments, it's important to understand which level of assessment an individual is accessing and really why. So level one would be an example, an example of level one assessment would be a neuropsychological exam. Uh, these are typically heard of as, as kind of your top standard, your gold standard uh, to identify clinical eligibility, um, identify diagnostic criteria, um, and can provide a lot of good information back to the team um, with, with that exam. Functional assessments or level two assessments do not provide a diagnosis, but they can provide the team with valuable information around service needs in a variety of areas. Um, and the, the, the valid and reliable um, tested brain injury a functional assessment um, that, that we access and, and that we uh, use in our contracts is the Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory. And that is in its fourth version at this time. Um, and then level three assessments, which many, many of you are likely likely familiar with um, are assessments that are used for service planning, which generally are left up to the discretion of agencies, um, state planning programs. Um, these may be um, non-disability specific um, and, and specific to needs in terms of providing services. And certainly um, these ones do not provide clinical or diagnostic information. So as I mentioned, the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, as well as national colleagues, identify the Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory, um, MPAI uh, for short, as a functional assessment that is validated for individuals with brain injury. Um, its original design, um, this, this design is a, supports and assists in clinical evaluation um, following acquired brain injury. Uh, assists in the evaluation of rehabilitation programs, um, and it also assesses obstacles to community integration. And this assessment is designed to evaluate cognitive, emotional, behavioral, social, and physical changes following a brain injury, and how those changes are impacting an individual's interaction with their community in regard to day-to-day -day living. So the Mayo Portland is a nationally accepted standard among brain injury assessments uh, to provide outcome data. And as we, as we know, most, if not all payers, including insurance companies and, and governmental agencies are requiring assessments as well as outcome data for programming. Um, this assessment was authored by Dr. Malik and um, Dr. Lizek, who give extensive nods to collaboration collaborators across the nation who assisted in review, providing feedback, uh, providing outcome data for further development and study for this assessment. Um, the Mayo Portland is also endorsed by nationally recognized organizations. And as I mentioned before, it's on its fourth revision um, and ratings are tested to be shown as valid and reliable in multiple ways. So this, the, this assessment reviews the most frequently affected areas of acquired brain injury that are considered by rehabilitation planning or other clinical inter interventions um, that include a range of, again, physical, cognitive, emotional, behavioral, and social barriers. 
um, that individuals may encounter following a brain injury. The development of the assessment uh, makes it possible for it to be completed by professional staff, uh, significant others, family members, and the individuals who experience brain injury. And research established in, in an available manual, and the um, link to that manual is actually, it's a free manual that's available to you, is, is on your last slide, um, shows the reliability of completion um, on the, to, to those rater groups. Um, it, also, it also provides information that shows that a group consensus on the evaluation with a staff member that is, or a professional that is familiar with the assessment is the most reliable and accurate way to complete this assessment. So I'm, I'm gonna use some time here um, to just briefly go through each of, each of the indices. Um, there are three um, subcategories that the assessment goes through um, that include ability, adjustment, uh, and participation. Um, and so we're just gonna break those down a bit for you. Um, so if we take a look at the first um, index, which is the ability index, this includes sensory motor cognitive abilities um, that are reviewed. And in detail, um, each of those components, I kind of I listed those on that slide for you so that you could see um, what, the, what those are. So we have um, where the assessor would be scoring for mobility use of hands, vision, hearing, um, motor speech, communication, atten attention and concentration, memory, fund of information, novel problem solving, visuospatial abilities, and dizziness. Um, and so for, for our purposes today, I do wanna just take the opportunity to, in each, each subscale that we take a look at, we'll just uh, kind of break apart one of these. So, oh gosh, that looks a little small. So we'll, we'll just go through this and hopefully in your um, handout, you'll be able to kind of um, zoom in on that a little bit. Um, so if we take a look at memory as an item by itself, uh, the heading provides us our guide to discover the client's abilities to learn and recall new information in relation to the skill of memory. Um, this assessment, uh, provides the assessor and the team with guided scoring. Um, so you're gonna note on these slides that I, that I gave just a little bit of informa information for the scoring zero through four, um, but each area then also has an ellipsis. So I do want you to be sure that you understand um, that this is just a brief notation um, of what that scoring could look like for the purposes of sharing this information. I just wanted to give you an abbreviated comment on what what is in the manual. Um, so, so here we can see um, the score of zero in memory would indicate that a person has normal learning, um, no delayed recall is demonstrated. Um, so when, and when available um, in some of these areas, the assessor can and should certainly review other um, clinical documentation, um, psychometric, uh, neuropsychometric testing, um, for example, would be um, certainly helpful in evaluating memory um, and can make note of the, and the other pieces that we would wanna make note of the client's age in comparison for, to normal development um, in relation to the impact of the issue that they may be experiencing. So as the scale progresses, um, you may be able to see that memory impairment increases in the interference of activities in day-to-day -day life. So a score up, up to a score of four, which may include learning information and retention being very limited, creating an environment where self-directing, self-directed um, compensatory strategies or techniques uh, would not be possible uh, for that person to learn um, due to memory impairment. So that is an example of memory. So the next index would be the adjustment index. And the ones that are covered here include mood, interpersonal interactions, and family interactions. 
Um, so in detail, again, you can see on your screen um, that the assessor is going to be taking a look at anxiety, depression, irritability, anger, and aggression, pain and headache, fatigue, sensitivity to mild symptoms, uh, inappropriate social interaction, impaired self-awareness, family or significant relationship impacts, initiation, uh, social contact or leisure, leisure and recreational activities. Um, again, for our purposes, we're just gonna take a look at one of these. And so if we take a look at fatigue, um, which if you're not aware is common for, um, which is common among those recovering from brain injury, um, we take a look at the manual uh, to lead a discussion on fatigue. So feeling tired, low in energy, fatigue ability, if you will, um, feeling low in mental or physical energy after a relatively low level or mental or physical activity occurs. Um, so as with memory, this assessment uh, provides the assessor and the team with guided scoring for every item. And again, more ellipses uh, for the purpose of noting that um, on the slide, it's just abbreviated comments and not the full document um, that would be available in the manual. Um, so here you can see that you have a score of zero in fatigue would, would indicate that a person has no significant fatigue to report um, or, or, observe, or that is observed. Um, we can see with a rating of one that this person would be able to com compensate with scheduled rest breaks, uh, for example. Um, and, and we see that throughout the Throughout the assessment, a score of one um, may indicate that maybe the issue is there, but it's being compensated for or uh, through medication, through um, a technique of some sort that the person has been able to gain a skill with. Um, so, and then up to, again, a score of four, where the individual's fatigue may be totally or almost totally dis disabling, um, and that person may remain inactive most of the time, um, even throughout the day, uh, due to fatigue levels. So next, um, so the third uh, subscale is participation. Um, and in this one, it uh, reviews social contacts, initiation, money management, residence, um, taking care of your own home, those kinds of things, living independently. Um, in, within the community. And so in detail, each component is scored for self-care, um, taking care of your home, your residence, transportation. Um, there's an area to score on um, how a person is interacting in terms of work and school, um, as well as money management. Um, I, I would note here, um, or you may note, that initiation, social contact, and leisure recreational activities are both in the adjustment uh, index as well as the participation index. Um, and so th while in the scoring process, um, there are, there's opportunity to look at scores in each index. Um, there's also um, a process in which you remove um, so that you're not double counting that, that information for a total score. So I guess just to note that for those of you that are detailed oriented when you take a look at those slides. So for our last subscale, um, let's take a look at residents. Um, this includes the responsibilities of independent living, homemaking, such as meal preparation, home repair, um, maintenance, medication management, personal health maintenance, um, and, and just as a note, there are other items that cover basic hygiene, you know, self-care things, and then money management. So those things are not included here, um, just to, to make a note of that. Um, there is um, also some notes within the manual of what other rating scales may be helpful. Um, for this one, for example, the supervision rating scale can certainly be utilized um, when, when going through this information um, and doing this assessment. And again, while being repetitive, I, I do want to again ensure um, that we're mentioning, as with the first two subscales, um, 
the assessment provides the assessor and the team with guided scoring for every item. Um, so you'll note on the slide the ellipses uh, for the purpose of noting that this is an abbreviated, abbreviated comment for what is in the manual. Um, so we can see here with a, a score of zero, this would indicate the client is capable of living independently, either alone or with others. Um, they don't receive supervision or assistance from others to perform those basic um, ADLs or, or um, instrumental, I'm sorry, instrumental ADLs um, and perform those at, a, at an acceptable level. Um, I would note that the conversation in this, on this topic also makes note of whether or not that person needs um, external motivation or external prompting to complete those or if they're internally motivated to complete activities around their home as well. Um, so, and then, <coughs> excuse me, um, moving up the scale, um, it increases concern around safety um, or ability to perform or complete tasks, uh, providing notations for the assessor uh, to indicate how much assistance or supervision is needed from none um, in a zero uh, to four where somebody may need assistance virtually all of the time. So again, I know for time's sake, because I know that all of your time is very precious, we did not cover each subscale um, or each uh, category in those in those scales um, in detail. Um, this was just a review um, and wanted to make sure that you could you could see visually see the 29 different areas. Um, and if you're considering to provide providing the assessment for yourself um, or within your agency, to be aware that the the MPA I4 um, does have a section that that reviews user qualifications. Um, it does indicate that the assessment, it can be completed by people with brain injury, their significant others. Um, it also can be completed by medical rehab professionals, as well as other designated observers who know the individual well. Um, assessors should have a professional, uh, professional who is experienced with the MPAI-4 um, to help review rating guidelines prior to making ratings and to be available to answer questions. Um, and then in clinical practices, um, comparisons among ratings can offer information about various perspectives and other effective rehabilitation planning, as well as reveal subtle, subtle uh, problem solving. Um, we do know that scoring and interpretation require um, or the user guidelines share with us that scoring and interpretation require professional training and experience. Ideally, professionals with training in testing and measurements would be available to clinical teams if they are using the Mayo Portland for clinical evaluation. Uh, we do know um, that the manual provides guidelines for rating and scoring um, that include modifications for children, adolescents, and, and then adults. Um, and there's considerations for normal physical and cognitive development based on age. While the Mayo Portland uh, uh, version four is designed to represent the symptoms of brain injury, um, the first 29 items are designed to reflect the current status of the person being rated, whether or not the condition um, whether or not there's conditions other than brain injury contributing to restrictions in ability, activity, or participation. Um, and if there are pre-existing or multi-occurring conditions that contribute to the rating, those are actually identified in another section um, that can be completed that identify um, if an individual has pre-existing conditions um, uh, either physical or cognitive, um, mental health, uh, substance use disorders, and or law violations that the team might, might want to be uh, communicating about. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, the scale, a scale is provided uh, for the assessor to support the development of a score um, in each area for the man in the manual and with details on how to provide that rating. 
Um, so we really do encourage, um, if you're interested in this, to be very familiar with the manual um, and be reviewing uh, the information provided there and understand that um, the assessor, whoever, whoever is providing the assessor, be very familiar with the rating scales and the content to support recommendations and, and be able to support conversation. Um, we use a lot of motivational interviewing um, or questions that may come up among team members in order to develop that consensus rating. And once scores are developed, there are um, national data sets uh, that can provide teams with suggestions of where a person's limitations fall in comparison to national data sets, um, suggesting uh, limitations and outcomes that they may be experiencing in, again, those three areas, ability, adjustment, participation, as well as an overall score. Um, we do feel that it's imperative that the team continues to value that person-centered service planning, um, utilizing the result as a tool to drive that, that service planning. Um, another value that we've seen is that, it, it, that in that consensus um, building uh, time frame, it does create uh, team participation um, in the evaluation and uh, there can be a lot of discussion points uh, to provide supporting documentation um, for service planning. It can also uh, create an environment for more effective services and supports that address very specific barriers based on brain injury. So we certainly recognize and understand that brain injury symptoms are not always immediately evident and our clients may not always be aware of the barriers that they are experiencing as a result of brain injury. Uh, it becomes even more powerful when those in the service field can coordinate an effective treatment plan um, or a more effective treatment plan with multidisciplinary teams of providers that have experience and knowledge um, across disciplines and, and bring their expertise to the table. Um, so we do encourage um, that you consider um, talking with your teams about brain injury screening. I know that, that our team is, is talking more about that um, and we see, see some um, development of uh, screening, uh, screenings happening in the state and potentially uh, looking at um, brain injury assessments to, in your service line. Um, so again, feel, feel free to contact our organization for uh, information or resources. Again, the last slide has uh, the link that would provide you a copy of the manual um, that, that, is a, that is free and available to anyone that wants to take a look at that. So um, I feel like I talked really, really fast. Um, so if we want to go back and cover anything, I certainly can. We have a little bit of time left here. My information um, is certainly up on the screen. If you, if you feel the need to um, send me an email, uh, feel, feel free to do that or, or give me a call. Um, and then of course for our statewide intake and referrals for the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa for our resource facilitation program or otherwise um, is there on your screen as well. Um, with that, I'll, Annie, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you to see whether or not we have additional questions Thank or you, questions Jill. that have come in. Um, we do not have any questions right now, so I'll give everyone just a moment to put those in if you haven't already. And just as a reminder, as June had said earlier, and if you're not already familiar, um, the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa's Neural Resource Facilitation Program is designed to help connect individuals with brain injury, um, along with their loved ones and the professionals that are serving them to the needed supports and um, services in the community that are available to them and to help navigate those resources. Um, and we're always here um, and available to provide case consultations to professionals. If you have a client with a brain injury and you are looking for resources or support and figuring out um, where to go or what to do, um, we're here to help with that. And we can also provide general training on brain injury um, through our neural resource facilitation program as well. Uh, so let's look at the questions here. Okay, here we have a question about, let's see. Uh, June, could you repeat how to get a copy of that manual? You said that web link. 
Uh, yes, actually, let me go ahead and flip to the last. Oh, and I, I apologize. I did not put the link on there. Um, I can send it out in an email following the session. Thank you. And and if you, it, you can also um, Google the Center for Outcome Measurement in Brain Injury um, is where that manual lives online. Um, again, the Center for, and that's up on your screen as well, the Center for Outcome Measurement in Brain Injury is where that, the, the Mayo Portland Adaptability Inventory version four lives. That, that manual lives online as well as a variety of documents that support that. All right, thank you, June. I think those are the only questions that we have. Let me see. Let's scroll down. That's all we have right now. Well, thank you, everyone, for being with us today, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.